the Space Manufacturing Session, and um, thank you for your patience here while we were getting set up. Um, my name is William Gano, or Bill Gano. Um, the basic idea behind this session, um, well, space manufacturing is going to be very important for developing space bearing civilization. And it's going to be very important to maintain a space-faring civilization. Um, that's a pretty broad area. We won't be able to cover anywhere near all the aspects of it uh, in one afternoon. But we would like to cover a few opportunities, take a look at a few of the near-term opportunities. Um, we don't have one of the speakers up there on the list. Um, I'd like to get Scott Facing here to talk about uh, some of the connections with these near-term possibilities and American competitiveness in general, uh, follow the, a little bit more of the real-world uh, connection, and then we'd like to cover some of the uh, some of the further out possibilities, another decade, two decades, uh, if everything goes right. Maybe a little longer if it doesn't. Uh, as you can see here, our uh, our speakers uh, almost all covered there. Uh, Glenn Chapman will be our first speaker. He uh, is an associate professor at uh, Simon Fraser University in uh, Burnaby, British Columbia. He will be talking about space, the ideal place to manufacture microchips. Our second speaker will be Alex Ignatio, uh, director of the Space Vacuum at the Taxi Center, uh, University of Houston. And he will be talking about microelectronics materials growth in the vacuum of space, future manufacturing possibilities in space. Uh, our third speaker will be Robert Hambright, uh, director, um, director of Aut the Automation Center at uh, Southwest Research Institute. Uh, he will be talking about automation and miniaturization of space experiments on board the space station Freedom. Um, I'm not sure whether that shouldn't extend to just space stations in general. Uh, we will then have a break and um, come back. We will have Scott Case uh, from the uh, Department of Commerce, Office of Commercial Space. Uh, the next speaker, after we uh, cover some of these near-term possibilities, our next speaker will be Hugh Davis, talking about the moon as a source of energy. Uh, he is the president of Davis Aerospace. And then finally, um, John Lewis was supposed to be here, but he discovered at the last minute that the only way he would be able to come here and, uh, and get back to Tucson in the time constraints that he had was to leave San Antonio about 20 minutes before he arrived. So um, I will wind up presenting his view graphs. Uh, just a couple of minor points here. I'd like to get uh, all the speakers to hold to about 30 minutes, uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes for presentation, and then time for questions. Uh, this session is being recorded, so we would like to have a a little bit more formal question uh, interaction. So it would probably work out best to have the questions after the presentation. For each question, we would like the speakers to summarize the questions here at the microphone and then answer the things for the benefit of, of the recording session. Um, other than that, you have to get quick start here. As I said, we will be looking at about 30 minutes per speaker. Uh, we will probably just try to, to adjust the schedule here during the break after the third speaker. Just have a short break there. We still will try very hard to get out of here by 5.30 so people will have a chance to get ready for the dinner this evening or whatever else. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Glenn Chapman up here. Um, we 
begin with, uh, Glenn got a Master of Science from Queen's University at Kingston, Ontario, a PhD in Physics at McMaster University, Hamilton, Ontario. Um, that was his academic uh, credentials. He served as a systems, as an engineering systems analysis analyst at the Windsor Utilities Commission in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, he's also been a staff member at the uh, Lincoln Laboratory, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He was working in digital integrated circuits there, and uh, he is now an associate professor at the School of Engineering at Simon Fraser University up there in early British Columbia. His research interests include large-scale restructurable silicon systems, and uh, he sounds eminently qualified to talk about the subject here. What I want to talk today about is something that's not near term, but uh, much longer term. When you want to take a look at something that we can manufacture in space, you need something that has a lot of uh, value for its mass. You need something that, ha that doesn't use much in the way of resources, and yet that the space environment has a natural advantage to use. Now, pretty much uh, what people have been looking at for the most part these days, have been things uh, such as, such as uh, crystal growth and materials processing, bio, uh, uh, biomedical filtering, that sort of stuff. Um, but what I want to talk about is actually using the thing that space has got the most of, nothing. And why that will is a net advantage for uh, one of the biggest industries on Earth. Right, next to you, Brad, please. And that's the microelectronics industry. Now, as this view graph shows, since the 50s, the uh, transistors and then integrated circuits have expanded to the point where it is now a $300 billion a year industry. That makes it the largest manufacturing industry in the world, it's bigger than automobiles now. Furthermore, um, as you can see on the graph here, This area is the military area that has had not much uh, growth in recent times. Mostly what's been growing is data processing and, com and commercial use. We expect to see that continue to grow. Probably you'll be seeing by the end of uh, uh, the year 2000 something in the order of 350 to 400 uh, billion dollars worth of uh, uh, semiconductor products going into commercial goods. Now the key to this is the, uh, the microchip, uh, the integrated circuit as it's called. The, this circle is called a wafer. What the, what the is a thin slice about half a millimeter thick, typically uh, four to six inches in diameter. Now, that's what you manufacture integrated circuits on, made out of silicon, very finely grown, crystalline silicon. The small squares in that diagram are the, uh, the size of an integrated circuit. Typically, uh, typically uh, current integrated circuit is in the order of a quarter inch on a side. Now, that means you get a few hundred to a few thousand per wafer. The important thing is that the integrated circuits are really uh, very, very cost effective for space manufacturing in the sense that they have very high value for their weight. As you can see from this view graph, you're looking at a cost in the order of a million dollars per pound, 2.2 2 million per, uh, per kilogram. Um,
if we take a look at uh, a common microprocessor, the new, uh, current generation microprocessors, uh, that view graph gives the uh, weight there, which you can see is not very much, but the price of one is about $400. Now, that's the price. Now, of course, when you see a standard integrated circuit, you see in this little package. Uh, right now, that pa it, it, it's very common for that packaging to be added in an entirely different place from where you have actually manufacture the circuit, so that manufacturing the circuit and shipping to Earth would not be too much of a problem. Uh, the, the value of the circuit is extremely high compared to the launch costs, even current launch costs, whether you talk of $2,000, $4,000 per pound. Now, the other thing down here is micro, uh, microchip manufacturing facilities are extremely expensive to set up. Typical cost for the newest level of facilities is in the order of a billion dollars. The reality is we're seeing the capital cost of microchip uh, facilities grow by in the order of uh, 15, 20% per year per annum. Operating costs uh, is also relatively high in the order of 100 million to 200 million dollars per year, excluding personnel costs. That's just what it costs you to maintain the equipment. So, um, down here. What is the major cost in terms of uh, what co uh, what is the fabrication cost of the chip? Capital cost, and the most important factor in that is what's called the yield. Integrated circuits are unlike most devices. It's as though your standard car company produced uh, this production line, and in the order of ten. 15% of the cars work. The rest of them they threw away. Now some people may argue that they should do that with most of the cars anyways, but um, the reality is that when you start off with a new design of chip, you're seeing in the order of only 1 or 2% of the chips manufactured actually working. And a very mature product you're seeing in the order of 50 to 80%. If for anything that improves yield, is of extreme importance in cutting down the costs of production. Okay. Now, I'm just going to briefly outline uh, for you people a little bit about uh, integrated circuit manufacturing, just, to, uh, just so you know some of the terms, obviously not going into the detail. On the top of that view graph, what you see is the silicon wafer with a layer on top of it, in this case a uh, simple layer of oxide. When you, what's done in an integrated circuit is you're what, doing what's called patterning the layers. You put down the layer of photosensitive material, you expose it uh, to a illumination system and, that, and, uh, and develop that, that leaves a pattern of resist on top, uh, as it's called. And then you etch away the excess materials using very, uh, various processes. And here, see you left with the little island of resist and, uh, and the uh, material. And then at the very bottom, you have, uh, when you remove the resist, uh, off to the side there, you see what the sort of pattern uh, uh, typically sort of looks like. Next view graph, please. This just to show is a uh, brief uh, illustration of various exposure systems. Off on the uh, left-hand side, you have what's called contact uh, exposure systems. And as you move across, things get more complex. The final one on the right-hand side is showing what's called projection exposure system. That's the, uh, if you want, you can think of that as a, uh, uh, the reverse of a slide projector. What it does is takes a image and makes it smaller and projects it onto the surface. And that's the typical way things are done now. This just illustrates all the sorts of levels that you get in the integrated circuit. Uh, you start off, you have layers of uh, oxide that is basically a glass, layers of uh, what are called polysilicon, that's polycrystalline silicon, metal, 
and additional there is bauxite, and this just shows how it's built up. Next to your Now, further, the, the thing that kills you in manufacturing chips is dirt, and the uh, more than anything else. And this uh, this view graph is showing human hair size uh, blown up, obviously. And that's uh, typical human hair is about three thousandths of an inch in diameter. That's seventy-five microns in the metric system. Dust particle on the order of one micron ruins your day in, a, in manufacturing. As is shown on the uh, left-hand side there, you've got a couple of lines and a little piece of dirt between them. And you get one little piece of dirt in the order of one to two microns, and you wipe out uh, those lines, and therefore your circuit won't uh, work. This uh, view graph is just a list of standard earth air Part of that particles in a relatively clean room. And you can see you're talking quite literally of billions of particles per cubic foot of air, that would, uh, most, many of which would man, uh, ruin your manufacturing. Uh, next to breath, please. This just talks about where you get most of the common particles. You can see uh, smoke, aerosols, uh, dust from cement uh, and walls, and that sort of stuff and the typical range of the, uh, the particles. Now, on the bottom here, in this rather strange looking graph, these lines here are uh, what are called clean room classes. And you'll see a line that says 100,000. What the 100,000 means there is 100,000 particles of approximately uh, 0.3 microns or, uh, or larger per cubic foot of air. The stat, this was actually something that was started by NASA back in the early days of the space program, setting the standards for clean rooms. Typical clean rooms that are used for dirty production these days have a thousand, part of, uh, class 1000, that's a thousand particles per cubic foot. Real manufacturing these days is carried out in rooms that have in the order of class 10, 10 particles per cubic foot to one particle per cubic foot. Next view graph, please. Now, this view graph shows what human activity does. Just sitting there, you shed 100,000 particles. If you try doing a little bit of moving around, you shed a 10 million. Uh, and this is a rather old drawing, but it was the only one I could get for a view graph. Is the suits that you wear in a clean room, so-called bunny suits, uh, as they're called. And you notice there, it's covered you from head to toe. You got a mask and a face mask. Now, these are somewhat. Uh, uh, basically, you're trying try as much as possible to isolate the human from the uh, from the room. The modern ones are, uh, that are used in the class one clean rooms, you have a helmet that looks, for all purposes, like a space suit. Instead of, but uh, you have a little canister that you breathe through so your terribly dirty air doesn't get shoved back into the room. For all intents and purposes, to go in a, uh, a modern manufacturing, semi uh, semiconductor manufacturing facility these days, you almost have to get dressed up as though you're going into outer space. This illustrates the uh, work that has to be done in order to make the rooms clean in the modern facility. And you can see on here, you've got ducts above, ducts below, blow air down from above through what's called HEPA filters, which are very, very fine filters uh, made up of layers and layers of paper and aluminum foil. Uh, so you have a constant stream of air, you have uh, Everything, because of all this movement of air, creates a lot of vibrations. You've got to have vibration isolation uh, equi uh, equipment for all the apparatus you're working on, especially the exposure apparatus. You have to have uh, utilities corridors where you can uh, vent all the, uh, the gases from the pumps that you're going to have so they don't get stuck in the room. Basically, as you can see, what you're doing is spending most of your time 
trying to keep the uh, keep out the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere near uh, from uh, the facility and minimize any human interference. So what that's telling you is obviously the last thing you want uh, is to build your facility on Earth. You want to build it on a place that's clean, much cleaner than space, you've got a vacuum. Now inherently, uh, that the, even the moderately, uh, what's called a moderate level pre uh, uh, pressure that you see in low Earth orbit is quite sufficient for most semiconductor manufacturing. That's far cleaner than anything you're going to get from the Earth uh, air. In addition, there are uh, two things, uh, uh, two areas that are very common on Earth that you have to try and keep out. Uh, the first is uh, inorganic contaminants, the worst of which is salt, common table salt. The sodium and salt is what's called a yield, uh, a, uh, a yield killer. Uh, there's a story of a manufacturing facility that was set up down in the southern uh, uh, U.S. here that they could not manufacture the ships. They set up an approximately $10 million facility and nothing would come out of it. Nothing would work that would come out of it. And in the end, they just tore it down because, uh, because semiconductor fabrication is a little bit of black art and you don't know what's killing the yield. Um, it, technically, it's what's called, uh, it had a high mobile ion content uh, in the oxides. When they tore it down, they found the cause of the problem. During the manufacture, the workman had stopped uh, uh, the building. Somebody had stopped for lunch. And he left his t little salt shaker in one of the air ducts in the building. And that was enough to kill the uh, manufacturing capability of that facility. So that's the level of sensitivity we're talking about. Um, in areas where they use salt on the roads in the winter, they have uh, yields of the circuits go down in the, in, during the winter time. So that, uh, because even though people scrub a lot, uh, uh, do a lot to try and prevent tracking that salt in, it just seeps in. The other problem, the car, uh, so naturally that's not something you're going to have to worry about in space. And naturally, of course, uh, the other thing that's a common problem on Earth are various organic chemicals. Uh, uh, that they're inherent in our environment is something else that's not inherent on Earth. The uh, atomic oxygen in space is going to tend to scrub those, uh, uh, help remove those chemicals, as is the hard ultraviolet light, and so on. So, um, just move down. Take a look at space. Okay, you don't, you're, uh, you're going to have an awful lot of uh, automation, but the reality is now that you're trying to eliminate humans from fabrication facilities as it is, so that doesn't uh, matter to you. Um, we're going to na uh, naturally... Uh, we're naturally going to have um, the ability to uh, in space, deal with facilities that are very clean. We're not going to have anything uh, added to, uh, coming in from the outside. So it's a very controlled environment. In the areas where you have to have pressure, you can leak an atmosphere in that is going to be inert. That means that you don't run into some pro a very common problem in manufacturing steps, which is that. Um, when you expose something from uh, one of the manufacturing steps into the Earth's atmosphere, it tends to grow a small amount of, of an oxide on it. That causes you problems. Okay, now we move into uh, a more direct uh, application of the vacuum. That is, uh, many manufacturers, uh, many of the uh, manufacturing steps you have in microchips involve a vacuum themselves. In point of fact, uh, you spend an awful lot of effort trying to create small volumes of a moderate level vacuum. Next to that. 
And that's done basically for growing thin films, uh, and depositing thin films, and other processes. This just talks about the various levels of pumps. You can see there's all sorts of different pumps depending on the level of vacuum that you're looking for. This is the, the lowest level of using simple piston pumps. Then you get into the fusion pump. This is the area where we're talking about actually. Uh, this, that's the level of vacuum that you're going to see in uh, a orbital facility without making any attempt to reduce the vacuum level. Um, uh, actually, the next speaker is going to talk about the Wake Shield project, which, uh, uh, which uh, can produce extremely high vacuums in space. But I'm not going to discuss those. This just illustrates a common facility for producing vacuums in Earth. Uh, in Earth. And you can see that there's a lot of equipment down at the bottom for obtaining a relatively small vacuum facility. Um, where do you use these vacuums? Well, I'm just going to give two small uh, examples. Uh, first is in deposition areas. And what you tend to do there is uh, create a pretty good vacuum, and then you leak a little bit of uh, 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 gas into it, argon, in point of fact, and create a small plasma. And that, uh, uh, and that the those will hit the argon atoms uh, will be made bombard the surface of a material, typically, uh, for example, aluminum, which knocks those atoms off, and those are what's called sputtered onto the surface of the uh, of the uh, material you're trying to deposit on. Uh, next view graph. Another common thing that's done is uh, what's called ion implantation. That's basically where you accelerate uh, atoms to a very high, uh, to a moderately high power, to uh, 200, 300,000 uh, uh, electron volts, and hit the, uh, slam them into the surface for what's created called uh, doping the surface. Now, the purpose of uh, the last view graph and this is just to illustrate to you that most of the volume and the facility that you're ta uh, talking about is spent creating these vacuum areas where, uh, where you do the real work. The vast majority of the equipment uh, that you have in a typical semiconductor facility for the vacuum, if the vast majority of the cost of that equipment is creating that vacuum. The actual cost of uh, doing the, the deposition or the ion implantation or anything else is relatively small. The cost of maintaining the small vacuum for it is very high. So the effect of all of that is that you reduce the capital cost of the equipment. You can get away with much simpler equipment. You just build the, the guts of it that does the work out in the vacuum. And you don't have to have all the pumping equipment. It also vastly reduces your production cost because those vacuum uh, uh, those vacuum pumps have to run 24 hours a day. They're high maintenance items, they cut, and they do. They cost you a lot in terms of energy just to run, uh, just to keep your facility running. In addition, you're having to have, spend quite a bit of time from the time you bring a wafer into an area to do a deposition on it. You've got to spend quite a bit of time pumping on it to get the, to get the uh, vacuum down to the level you want. Or you can do anything. Other advantages of vacuum. And there we're talking about, uh, for example, you don't have to have contamination. You can avoid a lot of contamination. A typical sort of thing that happens in the modern facility is you'll do a deposition in, a, in the vacuum, then you bring it up to an air. Well, when you bring it up to the air, you expose it not only to the dirt, the organic chemicals, but also to the oxygen, which grows thin oxide layers. You then spend an awful lot of time getting rid of those thin layers before you do your next processing step. Um, it's also safety-related uh, issues. Uh, if you take a look at the gases used in a typical sem uh, semiconductor facility, they bear names like arsine, chlorine, phosgene, 
They, they're really a witch's brew of World War I uh, death gases. The last thing, it's very nice to talk about being able to take the cylinders containing those and leave them outside the station so that when there is a leak, you don't have to evacuate the facility. Uh, in the facility that I was in, the, uh, the building usually got dumped at least once every month or two, not because we had a leak, but because the alarms that were, have to be, of course, very sensitive to detect these things uh, would be going off and false alarms. Okay. Um, just move down to some microgravity advantages. I haven't talked about microgravity advantages. Um, the main ones from fabrication, excluding the growth of the crystals themselves, which is another area. The main advantage is, is you get some handling uh, advantages from being not having to worry about the gravity field. Basically, uh, the current wafers, which are eight inches in diameter and a little more than half, uh, uh, a little more than half a millimeter thick, um, they have they have a tendency to warp a bit under a gravitational field because you get this thin pie plate. Therefore, eliminating the gravity field uh, gives you some handling advantages. In addition, you might be able to talk about making them a little thinner. And the important point about that is now about half your, uh, when you grow a crystal, a silicon, about half the silicon you, uh, you have grown in that crystal gets wasted in the fact that you're cutting it up. So be, making your layers thinner would be a net advantage. Of course, there are a few disadvantages from uh, uh, fabricating stuff in space. Uh, for example, you have to worry about a little bit about outgassing at the facility uh, affecting you. That shouldn't be too bad in low Earth orbit. The, as I said, the, for these processes that I'm talking about, the quantity of the vacuum that you need is not very high. You do, um, you do have, though, uh, to worry about a few other things. Um, one of the major ones is that a common handling uh, mechanism that's used now it relies on air pressure. Uh, you draw a little vacuum at the back of the uh, wafer and holds it in place or it's moved, maneuvered around that way. Unfortunately, you can't do that if you use the vacuum facility, so you have to use mechanical grabbing. That has a tendency to uh, cause small chipping of the, uh, of the wafer, um, and therefore may have an effect on the yield. The other thing is um, the way you commonly spin on an awful lot of film, do films, is by what's called spinning on. And th that's illustrated here. You puddle a little puddle of a liquid. Photoresist is a common thing. And then you start uh, on a wafer that's sitting on a vacuum chuck, and then you start it spinning. And the result of that is that the wafer is held in place by the vacuum, and uh, the gravity pulls down on the fluid, and the centrifugal force uh, throws a, uh, is operating, so it tends to throw the material out. You get a nice, flat, uniform film. That you can't do in that same way in zero G, and you can talk about various centrifuge type mechanisms to create the same sort of thing, but it is a disadvantage, which brings the possibility of considering that uh, the moon may be one of the more ideal places to do manufacturing, where you have a small natural gravity field. But I haven't explored that all that much. Okay. Conclusion, I, I'd like to argue that Earth is clearly not the place you want to do uh, for ma uh, manufacturing microchips because in reality you're constantly fighting the Earth environment. And the actual environment for doing uh, microchip manufacturing is in space. In the long term, I think that's where we'll be doing it. In the short term, uh, it's going to be mostly experimental to try and prove that. Thank you.
things could be held off until the break time. What about heart radiation? One of the problems with very fine microchips is that you can have a cosmic ray drill a hole through it effectively at a microscopic level and, and kill it by, uh, by shorting it out. Yeah, the radiation level in low Earth orbit, um, that's why you want to be relatively low, is not too bad. The reality is when you manufacture uh, an integrated circuit, all, of these pro all this processing introduces an awful lot of radiation damage to the chip itself. So the very last step that you do is a sintering step, uh, typically of about 450 degrees C for half an hour. And that tends to remove the radiation damage. So what you would probably do is manufacture the chips in orbit and then do that last sintering step down, at, uh, down on Earth. Um, and I should add, by the way, as I referred to earlier, you tend to ship, uh, manufacture the chips in one place and package them elsewhere. It's very common now for chips to be manufactured in California and then shipped over to Singapore before they do the packaging just uh, because of the cheap labor there. So uh, moving stuff around for final steps is very common.
so people who are uh, disturbed about uh, technical leadership and, and the role of the manufacturing economy uh, have been looking at this, and they realize that uh, not only is that important if you have to be in the industry itself that makes things, uh, it's also important if you want to have an economy that generates jobs that produce high real wages. Uh, that if you uh, simply the proverbial flipping burgers, which uh, many people do as a start, that may be fine to start with, but that doesn't generate the high real wages necessary for long-term economic growth and improving, improving the living standards. To do that, you have to do high value added tasks like high technology manufacturing. And space is interesting uh, because it's one of the most highest value added tasks you can do. Uh, there aren't too many people who can do it. People who can make a competitive product in the space environment have an advantage. And if they can overcome all the terrible risks uh, and high capital requirements, it's an area that looks very, very promising. Not only for the products that you would make in space per se, but also because what it can teach you about working at the cutting edges of manufacturing technology. Now, to get to this, this first chart, one of the things that, that then has been going on, people are looking at technical leadership, is they've been making lists. Well, what kind of matters? What are the things that are important in the next few years? The Commerce Department uh, did its list of what it called emerging technologies, technologies that the Commerce Department felt uh, would be of interest uh, in driving uh, major areas of economic activity in the 21st century. The Defense Department did one of its own called Defense Critical Technologies, and as they looked at various threats and problems and emerging competition, they said, what are the kinds of technologies that we need in our defense industrial base make sure we can field the most capable weapons in the 21st century. And the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the President's Science Advisor, themselves uh, just recently released their latest and greatest list called National Critical Technologies, uh, which sort of took, the, took an amalgam of those uh, economic and national security related issues, also looked uh, at ones that related to sort of the basic research and engineering base in this country. And lo and behold, there was a lot of overlap. Because this is the, the one of the interesting things happening now is that we're seeing not a divergence between what matters in the military and economic communities, but we're seeing a convergence. Although the systems are very different, that is the way the Air Force or NASA would make a jet is very different from the way Boeing would make one uh, for the commercial market. The component technologies, the manufacturing processes, the science at the, at the base level are increasingly overlapping. Uh, the experience in Desert Storm uh, was a very profound one uh, for many of my friends uh, in the defense community uh, because they found commercial people uh, operating and providing capabilities much faster and quicker than they had in the traditional way. I was over at the GTE SpaceNet, the downloading station in Northern Virginia, and in the back of the parking lot uh, behind the facility which has Sprint and Kmart and all kinds of other people linking through their, uh, their ground station facility, there was this antenna mounted in the back of the trailer truck, and it still was painted desert brown, had the upside down B on it for the Allied Coalition forces. They just got this thing back from Saudi Arabia, where it had been on the front lines, rolling with the troops uh, into Iraq. And that thing was a commercial you know, GTE-based system that provided the only linkage for several series of cores in that area for a few days. And they had better communications, faster communication, back to the state because of that than they did through some of their satellite links, which were temporarily overloaded with other problems. And they would do things like put in orders uh, for spare parts back in the States that would go on a Federal Express plane, which would then show up and bring it in. And, uh, <laughs> this, this is rather a part. And, and, and one of the parts, for example, that got brought in, some of you may have, if you read Aviation Week, and seen this, and, uh, some of you are familiar with the Global Positioning System of Navigation Satellites, well, of course, one of the things that they were doing is they couldn't get enough of the military systems, which had very technical encryption and anti-jam capabilities. But the commercial things worked OK, and they were shipping these things, several thousands of them. Uh, there, you may have seen a wonderful interview on CNN where they were talking to this Iraqi, uh, Captain Iraqi general, and they were showing him this thing that they were using for position location, how it depended on satellites. He was very impressed. He thought this was a fantastic example of American technology. And wow, he said, I understand. He said, you mean every one of your core commanders had one of these things? I would, every one of my platoon leaders had one of these things. This is not an issue. And as we're going to going a period where the defense budget is declining, and as we're seeing increased economic competition overseas, the defense industry is going through an incredibly painful period, not only here but also in Europe.
And what this means is that people are more and more looking at integration of the civil and military industrial bases, particularly at the lower <coughs> level of manufacturing, uh, and, uh, manufacturing technology, in order to maintain an edge, both economically and for security reasons. So in some ways, I think it's very heartening that there's a lot of overlap between these areas, what we see is important for commercial competitiveness as well as national security competitiveness. Now, particularly in the manufacturing area, subject to this session, we notice things like flexible computer integrated manufacturing, even micro and nano fabrication, where Dr. was quite used to see that uh, in there, but it also benefited, I think, from the comments. Um, and the point is, is that the old sort of Henry Ford days of, uh, you know, let's produce a billion of something and we'll drive economies to scale, and that's how we make money, by dropping costs, is being replaced by concepts of flexible manufacturing where you make, you have a system that makes maybe one or two or even a small few dozen of something, and you're able to quickly reconfigure that system to make another few dozen of something. But the manufacturing system is not rigid, but in fact is very, very flexible. But in order to do that, you need to know a hell of a lot about uh, basic components, about quality control, about how you control your inventory. It's not just a matter of having the machines themselves build something. It's a matter of having a ma an entire management system that's set up <coughs> to operate incredibly quickly and respond to market forces in a very, very rapid period. The uh, next chart. Let me give you a feel for sort of you know, where we are in this. In flexible manufacturing, we're holding reasonably steady uh, versus Japan. We have a lot of capabilities. Not a lot of them are in place. Uh, the automobile and semiconductor industry being some of the more, more worrisome ones. But in terms of, of, of actual knowledge how to do this, it is there. It's not installed in some places, obviously. Other areas, we're losing. Not badly, but, but definitely starting to slipping. High density data storage, advanced semiconductor devices. Some of you have served the Semitech Consortium, which is trying to bring a lot of the manufacturing capability or keep it in the United States or at least make enough of it here uh, that we maintain the ability to manufacture advanced semiconductors. Areas where we're losing badly, uh, digital imaging technologies, uh, we're starting to make up some of that ground there. Some of you have been hearing about the high definition TV fights. Uh, as someone from the Commerce Department, if you've ever heard of the industrial policy debates, I still have the flash burn from high definition television. <laughs> uh, from that, we you know, were told by Mr. Sunil quite explicitly about the different industries. The problem is that something which looks to one person as picking a particular winner, like, hey, high definition television so you can watch HBO and do more crucial uh, detail than you can now. That's not the point. High definition television, for example, is a type of a, of, a, of a broadly generic technology that affects display systems in a submarine, that affects how you look at computer workstations, that affects how you deliver entertainment. Again, what's happening is you're seeing technology spread uh, through such a wide variety of channels. It's very, very difficult to say, uh, hey, let's push this company or this industry because you, know, you want to have uh, that particular technology. High definition television, X-ray lithography, optoelectronics, all these things um, have the very, very broad implications. And because of those broad implications, they also tend to be very, very expensive to do. They are not something that an individual company uh, can often come up with capital to do. We're talking in some cases a billion dollar investment to quit. Okay, now if an individual company can't do that, and a team with other companies to do these things, then you have those wonderful problems with antitrust laws. We tried dealing with that. There was a National Cooperative Research Act which uh, eliminates some of the antitrust restrictions for research activities. An area, however, uh, which is still somewhat restricted in our antitrust laws is joint production. That is, you may be able to cooperate with research and a really expensive technology, but going into manufacturing, actually building it, producing it, you again run into run into some of these problems. So there is, in fact, legislation introduced this year. We got solved last year. We try again this year, which is to eliminate uh, some of the some of the barriers uh, to joint production agreements upon companies that traditionally have been major competitors. For the space community, one of the hopefully immediate applications of this uh, is going to be in the new heavy lift launch systems, whereas there is the develop one of the critical cap is the development of the new uh, main engine. And what we're looking at with some of the engine manufacturers working on and so forth is that 
they can go in and actually go into joint production and produce the engine and not just do the R&D. Because if you're forming an industrial team, the kinds of agreements and intellectual property arrangements that you would make if you were just going to do R&D are different than the kinds of arrangements and teaming you would do if you were going to go into a 10-year production cycle with somebody. So this is a fairly germane problem uh, right now. And again, what it leads back to is that we have a series of technologies that are broadly pervasive, are very, very expensive. We're under increasing international pressure for both economic and national security reasons. And we need to find new ways of doing business with each other in order to stay in the lead, or at least not continue to lose so badly. Last chart. OK, a little bit more of an eye chart for folks in the back. Um, some trends. I gave you a, a snapshot of you know, kind of where are we uh, at one particular time. The kind of thick arrows here are sort of R&D oriented, the thinner arrows are for new products. One is for us versus Japan, other is us versus uh, Europe. Uh, and what you see in emerging manufacturing systems is that uh, the U.S.'s lead is declining in R&D as is its lead is declining uh, in, uh, in new products. Uh, we're staying some areas versus the EC. We're okay on R&D, uh, but uh, that's only into the, 19, only into the 1990s. Uh, you know, obviously these, these trends are disturbing, and one of the ways that, that people are reacting to that uh, is that by, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And so we're seeing increasing numbers of, of international teaming arrangements, uh, many of which are, are reflective of the increasing competition in the market. You said, why fight each other? Why not just cross and team with each other? Uh, certainly, international cooperation is a fairly reasonable, reasonable response. However, you find that sort of the balance of power in these teaming arrangements has a lot to do with who brings what to the table. If you are a relatively weak competitor, and all you're bringing to the table is your goodwill or access to your market, uh, because you threaten to throw up protectionist barriers and don't get what you want, uh, you will get relatively less out of that sort of exchange than if you come with a lot. Where the other guy is saying, well, hey, you're really smart, you've got a lot, uh, I will give you more favorable arrangements. So again, there's kind of this, this iterative process going on. On one hand, the degree to which we compete really hard and become a really serious competitor also enables us to drive better deals and cooperative arrangements. To the extent we drive cooperative arrangements, we may or may not uh, be able to maintain those competitive leads. And this, again, to, to draw an analogy for, for space, is this is precisely the kind of problems we're confronting in the Space Exploration Initiative. Uh, we sat down uh, about a year ago talking about, well, should we have international cooperation in SEI? And the State Department goes, yeah, fairly, we should, that's a good idea. And NASA goes, yeah, well, we'll look at the individual cases, but yeah, that's a great idea. And the Commerce Department goes, well, maybe not. And we say, look, the people who are our major economic competitors are also the ones who are the most capable of cooperating with us. We should think through what it is we want. Now, part of what we want in cooperation is we want people to help share the cost. But it's more than that. We also want people to bring things to the table where we can learn how to work more effectively in operating in space. For example, advanced manufacturing technology in Japan. That might be an interesting contribution by the Japanese to participate in SEI. We don't want just their money, we want their brains. And I think that that is, again, going to be one of the continuing themes that you'll see uh, as SEI itself evolves, as international cooperation and technology in general evolves, is these tensions between cooperation and competition. That if somebody comes to you with just money, you should be very wary. If somebody comes to you with money and technology and market access, then you have a basis of discussion. And finally, uh, I just sort of end with uh, uh, a sort of a, a point that uh, a General Motors executive was recently giving a talk, um, again, about the general industrial competitiveness problem, and saying that, um, uh, that many cases are academic institutions are, must share some of the blame, as well as industry, uh, for where we stand. Uh, he noted that just seven American universities offer PhDs in manufacturing uh, technologies around the country. And less than 3% of our colleges and universities uh, offer uh, engineering, manufacturing engineering majors at the graduate or even the undergraduate uh, sorts of levels. So we have lots of people who can do analysis, whether financial or even engineering analysis. We don't have as many people who actually know how to 
make something or how to design something. And so, and some, a lot of you have talked about that from time to time, but again, understand the problem. It's one thing to analyze something that's been put in front of you, whether financially or engineering wise. It's another thing to design something, create something uh, from nothing, uh, which is an area where uh, I think we have a weakness relative to our competitors. The kind of subject area that we talked about that should be taught, and I think we, we agree wholeheartedly with them, are things like the management techniques, quality, waste elimination, design for manufacturability, flexible manufacturing, systems engineering issues. These are things that I think I, I would argue that you should think about in looking at space manufacturing. You know, look at that interesting engineering problem about how you do deposition or how you something forms the way it's an interesting scientific issue. But please do not stop there. Look at the manufacturing process that that's embedded in. Look at how that relates to the rest of the organization that your company uh, is involved in. You know, how are your inventories going to be handled? How are you going to handle quality controls? How are you going to handle feedback from the market? But these are the kind of things that are the hallmark of successful manufacturing firms in the 21st century, whether in space or on the ground. And with that, I would like to have questions. You mentioned teaming and the antitrust aspects of that. However, my experience is more is less that and more the fact that the team members are really competitors and they don't know how to team or don't want to team. Mm -hmm. How is that resolved? That is something that, that even the federal government can't solve. Um, and <laughs> I mean, not not. That's not, not a fully, a fully, uh, a fully positioned answer. The, uh, there is a lot of, of competition uh, among the various team members, and I think part of the trick is where we've seen successful foreign collaborations is you start very, very small in common building measures that go over a fairly long period of time. For example, uh, you have another firm come in, and you'll have maybe one laboratory system where, say, a common laboratory system, and people are working together, and someone one quarter will show something interesting next quarter somebody else will show a response. It is not a matter where you throw off of your books, they open throw open theirs. It's a matter of a series of very, very graduated responses, and it's one where you're thinking continually over how does this fit into your business plan. Like I said, the combination of money, technology, market access that you're, that you're putting in there. Uh, one way for, for confidence building is given a very uh, limited place where you can say control potential damage of lost and lost property or, or industrial espionage. Uh, is have a sharing rate where you send someone into another person's lab, they send some person here, just to get a feel for the place. And then you start putting in a series of milestones where you share one or two things over a period of years. It is not something that is built uh, instantaneously, nor should it be, because no new agreement can really, really guard against that. It's one where there's a collaborative effort that makes sense over a long period of time. And I guess the only answer I really have is simply starting small. The antitrust arrangement simply trying to prevent situations where companies don't even try to talk to each other because of fears of a lawsuit from the Justice Department. And that's I'm trying to do is eliminate a government disincentive, not put any proactive things that says you, know, you should cooperate. Uh, that way get get into the picky winners and losers problem. Could you uh, list the reasons for America's lack of competitiveness in order of importance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well Oh, I ended up faced with the same question, but when you hear like in some of the business meetings and discouraging remarks about how America can never hope to compete against Pacific Rim countries because they've got a speed in labor, they, they don't have the union problems, and they got better management system. But then the Japanese have a Honda plant operating in Ohio, you know, mm -hmm. and they're still making a big dent in the office. Sure, so sure. what what are sure. you know, I mean, the I mean, primary thing that give them an advantage? There's, there's, there's a series of series of inter interrelated problems. And and uh, you know, one thing like patient affordable will happen. Because you, because you have a large federal budget deficit, you capital, our cost of money are higher. Yes, there's a wage uh, problem and so forth. But you never <coughs> are going to make a, a competitive U.S. economy with high standards of living, high real wages, by trying to compete with dollar an hour wages you know, in some place in the third world. What you have to do is your, pro I mean, the, the, the key measure of merit is, is productivity. And your productivity simply has to be higher than other people. And I think what that relates to is, is not just the management system in terms of you know, formal line of authority and boxes and chains and things, but 
but it matters is how do you make something from an ambient standpoint? What does your manufacturing basis look like? How, do you, how are you controlling your inventory? How much have you automated? What sort of technologies have you put uh, in place? And, and by technologies, I mean not just the hardware. I mean uh, the, you know, the systems management technologies that the Honda plant uh, in, uh, in Ohio uh, shows. I mean, there's nothing about American soil that sort of rejects you know, those, sort of, those sorts of ideas. So there's a series of environmental problems, definitely <coughs> labor rates and so forth. Uh, but more basically, uh, it's, it's simply a matter of increasing productivity and working smarter, not just longer hours and harder. And I think and the, the key uh, to those things is recognizing the link between having an advanced R&D concept or scientific concept and translating that into something very practical. And you saw several things here today about how you translate scientific laboratory concept into something practical. That, that's where the beef is. That's, that's, the, that's the key problem. One of the ways people have uh, seen this problem of competitiveness in recent years have uh, reacted is by saying, well, gee, you know, all those other people are stealing our ideas. Let's just uh, try and restrict the information flow to them. Uh, unfortunately, my experience has been that that tends to restrict the information flowing back these days in person. Do you see the tendency to restrict information flows being something that's getting worse or is something that's going to ease off? People recognize that it's a mistake. I think there's going to be more efforts at aggressive in terms of restricting information flow. I mean, if you have a word about, gee, we're really smart, but all our ideas kept keep going overseas, and then we can just sort of stop that. I mean, you've got two choices. You can either run faster or put weights on the other guy. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you do a combination of both. I mean, the, the, the problem is that, um, to, some extent, to some extent, the problem is almost self-correcting. And I think the Japanese are running into this, running into this now, that they, that they, and as well as Europe, sees the need to do more basic research, because as they've closed the gap with the United States, uh, in many of well, I'll tell you, the United States is still far away, fantastic leader in basic research. But as that gap is narrowed, they've realized that in the longer term, they are going to have to be the sources of new ideas and more things you're going to coming to the international marketplace. So from a, from a long-term perspective, the answer is yes, yes, more sharing of intellectual ideas, let, let stuff uh, you know, run around the globe easier. That's probably best for everybody, <coughs> everybody in the long term. But that doesn't answer the question for, for an individual company or firm trying to make a decision about how to protect its own intellectual capital. And, and, and for, from a company's standpoint, I think you're seeing more and more of an emphasis on reciprocity arrangements. Not ones where we say, hey, we'll open our books, you open yours, and we'll collaborate and hope for the best. You're seeing much more focused uh, transactions where intellectual concepts and ideas are treated as a form of commerce, as a form of capital in and of themselves. So from, from a, a standpoint of uh, the larger world, I think we're getting agreements on protecting intellectual property rights. We're trying to extend more and more of that international trade negotiations, uh, keeping that fairly open as, as, as a playing field. But from an individual company standpoint, you're seeing you know, much more mercenary calculations about how the information is shared. I think the tricky problem uh, for us is what do we do about federally supported, or publicly supported in general, including state governments, supported R&D, that is, the role of foreign uh, entities and things like these CPIC, NASA CCDSs, the role of their interest in foreign participation in universities uh, and in uh, federal labs around the country. I'll tell you, in many areas I know, uh, one particular case I can think of in space structures, um, if it were not for foreign money, some areas of research simply would not be happening in some of the universities. I mean, some of the guys feel badly, they go, if the guy with briefcase shows up at 20000 bucks for a gallon share, what am I going to do, throw him out of the room? I mean, at, and I think that that's <coughs> fine at the basic research level. I think I think having that kind of foreign involvement is, is good for everybody. It's when you start moving above that level and you start talking about making a product that I think you have to be a lot more versatile. And I think that's one of the responsibilities of individual companies. Could you comment on what seems to be a growing trend among uh, corporations in the electronic field, especially at least one example, I think up here in Texas, where corporations are trying to not just protect their, their uh, new intellectual property, but trying to like, rewrite history and, and try to go back and take bigger and bigger chunks of people's uh, other corporations. Tires the elbows get sharper, yeah. um, and uh, yeah, 
companies going back and saying, no, no, we invented transistor first. No, we invented it. Right. And yeah, what you're, what you're, yeah, and that, I think, I, I think we have to say that that's simply I think, an unfortunate side effect of the realization that intellectual property is, in fact, something important. It's something that people were fairly lax about for a long period of time. And I think that this, the, the some attempts to, to rewrite history, uh, if you will, for um, example, people sort of making up for the fact that they were, in fact, sloppy when they were uh, thinking about their intellectual property in the first place. I don't know if that will really, really even out. I think it's part of, some of these, some of the inventions are so complex. Uh, you know, the lone inventor who gets a light bulb idea or three or four guys get a bright idea are increasingly, increasingly rare. And what you're talking about really is fights between patent lawyers and competing companies. And uh, that is one of the areas that not to say anything nice about rewriting history, but that is one of the areas where uh, we have increasing foreign conflicts uh, and where we're trying to get stronger intellectual patent, uh, property protection overseas. Some of the trade and investment agreements that we're trying to put in place with the Soviet Union, a big sticking point in intellectual property, and that's trying to point intellectual property right concepts, you know, in the Soviet Union. You know, they want to agree with you, but they don't quite know what you're talking about. <laughs> one more question. Yeah. You have been, uh, in a sense, assuming that there's something we want to make for these a company, a consortium, whether they be foreign or domestic. What do we want to make in space? What does everyone agree is likely to pay off commercially, regardless of the competitive pressures? Mm -hmm. you know, how do you in, in space? The, the, short an, the short answer is as both 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 as an official answer and an unofficial answer. I have the faintest idea. <laughs> Okay. Don't, don't fact, you think we need to define that a little better right. before we get well, something going? Well, I think that, and I would, I would say something even, even more bold, is I think it would be, even if I did have an idea, it would be a mistake for me wearing a government hat to pretend I was French or Japanese and say that I, in fact, knew what that what that product is. Space manufacturing is an area that, in terms of the official view, in my view, is one where we don't know yet what it is in an environment where we are doing research to try to figure out if there in fact is something to make. But we do know what product. people want. We know they what people want. For example, clean energy systems. Why not focus on an energy industry in space, building the facilities how there, you, right. space over power, for example, as a goal? Sure. And how do you, and, and how do we yet know that that is a uh, an obvious way to go to what degree we should be Unfortunately, we won't know that until we do the work. We, we won't know that until we can't be we defined work. without doing the, the work. Right. And that is why the, the inclusion of, of the research for space-based solar power is something that we've encouraged you know, in something like the National Energy Plan. I mean, that's, that's something. Well, but that's you never hear about it. That, that's right. And the reason, and the reason is because it is still still seen as, as an R&D kind of activity. Okay, that's the gap between the concept and where, we, and where we are. Now the, answer, now, the answer is you go in and you start doing the work right. by identifying the research agenda that has to be done. And you, don't, and you don't pretend, I think, to anybody that this is, in fact, the salvation for all our problems, so let's ramp this thing up really fast. What you say is you have a series of fairly discrete technical problems that this is an energy option which is worth pursuing. No one can deny it's a worthwhile goal, however. No, not at all. You say, not at all. And I think it's very important to have those goals. And then something. discover whether they are, techni uh, they are technologically realizable. But right. you've got to have the goal. I think by articulating it, we get people busy. Yeah. And there are and there are people who are in fact doing it. And, and to and to be uh, totally glib, I mean that's something that the national, that's one of the reasons why the National Space Society exists is because you have other sources of ideas and stuff. Come up. Just as there, just as diversity and competition is important in the commercial market, it's important in the marketplace of ideas as well. And the reason why you have things like National Space Society which is beneficial for society in general is because there are places to incubate, filter out, stomp on, refine uh, ideas uh, before you get some something like the, a government of lumbering down that particular road. This is the kind of area of place in the research environment, the university environment, where that kind of competition should occur. So no, I don't think I can <coughs>
but he spent 17 years with NASA uh, down at Johnson Space Center. Um, done a lot of things there. Uh, he's also uh, one of the co-founders of Eagle Engineering uh, down in Houston. And uh, well, e Eagle has done a lot of consulting for people like Space Industries and you know, other things like this. Um, he's currently president of Davis Aerospace Company, uh, working on return to the moon. And he will be focusing on the moon as a source of energy for the Earth. Useful and available to you in other locations 
most particularly the surface of the moon. And that resulted in my being asked to solve the space transportation problem, which was a very, very large space launch task. And the cost of that space launch, even with economies of scale, which we've heard today may be doubtful, it may be diseconomies of scale if the miniaturization grew, grew is correct. Uh, but it was such a massive task that it swamped any possible hope of having beneficial costs for power from space. Furthermore, we were permitted no bootstrapping. We had to transport the city of San Francisco from Frankfort, Kentucky to San Francisco intact. And I doubt seriously that that's the way that the actual exploration and exploitation, not a dirty word, of space uh, will unfold. I think bootstrapping is certainly something we will do. Now, the key to having a space exploration initiative, in my judgment, is going to be to make use of the resources of the moon to bootstrap our space activities. I think that this bootstrapping is going to be truly enabling to our doing the sorts of things that our president has said he'd like us to do. Helium-3 from as a fuel for terrestrial fusion solar power reactors is one proposition for energy from space. Uh, Dr. Jerry Kosinski of uh, the University of Wisconsin and uh, ex-Senator, ex-astronaut Jack Smith have both been very strong proponents of bringing back the isotope of helium, the light isotope of helium, that's resident on the grains of the lunar regolith material deposited there by billions of years of solar wind as a fuel for terrestrial-based fusion solar reactors. Now, no one yet knows whether or not the fusion reactor will become a commercial product. No one knows whether the approximately one decade increase in the time temperature product necessary for that fuel combination will yield a commercially viable fusion reactor using helium-3 fuel in the immediate future. Uh, I don't believe that the use of the moon, however, is limited to that one option because I'm convinced that the solar power satellite built largely from lunar materials is an equally viable option. Dave Criswell now at the University of Houston has suggested that we leave our energy uh, producing devices that we heard earlier about uh, solar cells built on the moon. He wants to do that in grand style and to build very large aperture phased array antennas to transmit the energy directly from the surface of the moon to the surface of the earth during those intervals when orbital mechanics makes that possible. Now, the talk today is, is a, a very short and uh, not non-technical version of a study that uh, I completed in March under contract to the United Technologies Corporation, where they asked me to take an independent look at what it really took to do this thing that Jerry Kosinski says we should do. Uh, there have been a number of papers that have been put out in the literature, some of them by the University of Arizona, that are some very good work, some of them by the University of Wisconsin, that bear on how we might go about acquiring helium-3 from the moon and return it to Earth for our fusion reactors. And they asked me to take a you know, look at all of this stuff and tell them what I thought that we might be able to do and put together a logistics scenario that took it from soup to nuts. And when we will begin, in about 2010, shortly after the initiation of the Space Exploration Initiative, and building up in sort of an S-shaped curve to be producing 200,000 megawatts electric on Earth from fusion reactors using this helium-3 as fuel by the year 2050. And to sustain that power output for an interval of about 20 years just to get some idea as to what steady state might look. So I did that. And the conclusions of that, the results of that study were that uh, yes, uh, though it constitutes a large uh, space logistics task, I believe that we can acquire a sufficient amount of lunar, lunar helium-3 to support this 200 gigawatt electric of fusion power if we have the need and the market to do so, and more importantly, if somebody will pop for the very large front-end cash it takes to pull it off. Uh, to do this is going to require that we establish by 2050 some 50 lunar mines and processing plants 
Each one of these is which is about the size of a medium to medium large coal mine here on Earth with an associated process plant located adjacent to it. Now, though we're going to use automation and robotics to the maximum extent possible, the early estimates of what it would take to provide the human oversight of these machines is about 50 people per mine. And that sounds like a large number of people, but considering that you're picking up 20 million tons a year of material, you're processing at least half of that through a fairly complex set of processes, and you're having to do it around the clock. That's really not a large staff of people. But it does result in this forecasting that we'll have 2,800 humans working on the moon by the year 2050, if we're to do this. Now, bootstrapping was employed on this beginning about 2025, thinking it would take you some 15 years before you really began to seriously do lunar manufacturing after you arrived. But uh, very shortly, you were in the process of producing 90% of your total material needs from lunar materials for the lunar bases themselves and all of the rocket propellants except for those that were used to far low Earth orbit from lunar materials by the year 2050. And because of the dilute nature of helium-3 in the lunar regolith, we found we had massive quantities of marketable products, if there is a market in space for these, uh, that would be generated. The space transportation system we have to, to do this would have to place uh, uh, something by 2032 or 35 it would have to build up to have the capacity of placing 6,000 metric tons per year of uh, material uh, into lunar orbit, principally to establish your production and mining equipment uh, base on the moon. And this would require a heavy lift vehicle in the 300 metric ton payload class, which is not ridiculous. The Soviet Energia is between 100 and 200 today. And we'd have to fly at some 25 flights per year which isn't a large multiple beyond that of what our current flight experience on shuttle has been, of some 8 to 12. The personnel launch system would need to carry 15 to 25 people per flight. We'll need a new system that is an electric propulsion stage that's capable of hauling some 200 metric tons of cargo each trip in order to economically transport uh, these goods and material outbound that don't involve the people. But we'll have to have a separate orbit transfer people uh, for people to make the trip in about the three days that we did for the Apollo uh, program. Now the lunar landing vehicles will be a multi-purpose, multi-mission mode vehicle that will derive, except for the first three to five years of the scenario, all of its propellant requirements, both hydrogen and oxygen, from the moon. Uh, these need to be larger than we've seen in such things as a NASA 90-day study by about a factor of six. <laughs> Uh, in order to be able to establish this type of thing. The uh, lunar human sus substance, sustenance systems will need to be set up to be quite nice because we'll ask people to go there for, after we've entered into this thing a few years, for a two-year tour of duty. So the human transport at the beginning and end of their tours of duty turned out to be one of the most difficult and, and costly of the, of the logistics enterprises you had to undertake. And of course, we're going to have to establish and operate a significant set of industrial facilities on the moon for the mining, the processing, space manufacturing of not only rebuilt but new equipment, and of course, utilities such as electric power. <coughs> the conclusions that I reached from this study, and I don't want to attribute these to the sponsor, these are my own. I believe that recovery of solar wind volatiles is a worthwhile thing for society to do, even if a market for this helium-3 fusion fuel does not develop. I believe that we'll use that mechanism for acquiring our propellants to be a spacefaring Earth. I believe that if we're going to put people on the surface of the planet Mars, we must use the sprint type of mission in order to reduce the cosmic ray exposure of the people that we ask to go. That, in turn, is going to require that we use nuclear stages to do that job. Nuclear stages in our biosphere do not coexist gracefully. I have no concerns about launching a nuclear propulsion 
rocket. My concern is when we pull the rods to activate the reactor, and from that point through eternity, or through at least three or four half lives of the of the products that are generated. So I think that we may very well find ourselves in a position of doing the uh, mining and manufacturing, at least of gases on the moon, may be enabling for going to Mars, because it will enable us to base our nuclear stages in orbit about the moon or at a libration point and use hydrogen that's derived from the lunar regolith as opposed to that brought from Earth. There are sufficient carbon-bearing gases also trapped on the regolith that we may very well find ourselves with a significant lunar petrochemical industry about the midpoint of the next century. We have an adequate supply of metals, glasses, cast basalt, and most any other credible industrial product that you can name that's available if there is a viable commercial market for it. I think we need to devote a significant body of work beyond what we've devoted so far to better understand the lunar equipment and personnel needs and that I think we need to put particular emphasis on this miniaturization and automation so that we can precede humans' arrival on the moon by a robotic lunar resource station by some three to five years. And when the fellows arrive, they will have a capable power plant, communication facility, and a stockpile of water, hydrogen, oxygen, and other useful commodities waiting for them. The issues that, of course, here are these. I won't read all of these things to you. But uh, one of the principal ones, I think, is the next to the last bullet. Of what does it take to learn enough about this to make an informed decision for a really major program? And that's something that none of us today have a good handle on. <coughs> In the 1970s, we proposed about a $20 million program to follow on the earlier program on the SPS, solar power satellite, that was not funded. Uh, I think that it would be something escalated toward the inflation over these past 15 years of about that magnitude would get us to the first major decision point where we'd have sufficient wisdom to know whether we should proceed or not. But we're not going to reach that state of knowledge without making this initial, I think, relatively small investment, but it's one that I believe is an imperative for our nation to take leadership on. The final bottom line bullet is not going to ask be answered for a very long time, but I think it will be a mistake to say that we can't produce five cent per kilowatt hour power, therefore it's no go. Because by 2050, who knows what we'll be paying for power when we have had all the ecological constraints imposed upon the manner in which we generate it with coal. I don't know whether it will be 10 cent, 25 cents or dollar per kilowatt hour. If it's dollar per kilowatt hour, believe me, society won't be using very many kilowatt hours because we'll be a very poor global society. But the prospect for cost-effective base load power from space is, of course, the bottom line, and we've got to pay attention to the bottom line. But we make sure that when we're talking about the bottom line, it's a contemporary bottom line of the time the decision needs to be reached, not one of today. The technology development plan might have these elements. Again, I'm not going to read them to you. You can read them yourselves, and I do have a few copies if anyone wants copies of this stuff. I think we need to renew these space energy system studies. And the timeline for that on the last chart tells me that our first major decision point is about seven years from when we begin the process. The longer we wait, the more that's going to move out in time. So it's my contention that this initial investment, which might be in the 20 to, I'll take a while, I guess, up about $50 million range, to get the technology program in place to finally fly this thing that the scientists have asked for for many years, the Lunar Polar Orbiter, and to do the, uh, the design and get into this business, the mining and processing industry people, as well as our space cadets, better understand what we're doing from a practical manufacturing point of view, it's going to take us something like seven years. And I think we should begin. Um, I think that's the life chart. Thank you very much.
for a couple of questions here. You could. When you start talking about the seven-year time frame, sort of, I'm getting the impression that mostly we're going to be doing a lot of studies of these things, which is what we've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years. I, I, I think we're different. We have not been doing it. Well, maybe not the government has to them, but other people. Study. What we really need to do, what we really need to do, is start getting hardware up for two or three years. Which would be, you could certainly get demonstration solar power satellites to go out or two in orbit within a couple of years. If you make a decision. We don't have time for it today. I got a nice pitch on converting an IUS to two tons of used material on the moon. We put the seven of them together for this base in five years. That's not a bill. I agree with you. Sure. Uh, uh, you mentioned the kilowatt hour ba uh, uh, rate, and I agree that's not an appropriate number. A more appropriate one would be total energy payback. So yes. How much energy do you use to get there versus how much you're going to generate after 200 uh, gigawatts? So. That, that's been looked at to some depth, and the numbers turned out to be quite favorable 10 or 15 years ago. That wasn't the issue. The energy payback was quite favorable because of the dollar, the cost of the law service in our city. Go ahead, Bill. You think it's yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanted to point out that we need to uh, address the issue of what it will cost if we do not do this. Yeah. I, I talk a lot about space solar power basic uh, to just general audiences, the Kiwanis, the Sierra Club, the uh, <clears throat> uh, the Audubon Society, 99% of those people have never heard that there is any space energy option at all. When they hear about it, they want to know why nothing is being done about it. I assure you they are willing to start paying for feasibility studies on the demonstration level that you're talking about uh, here. When you put up, pardon me? Who's willing to pay for it? The people of the United States of America, when they hear there is such an option, you know, we think that everyone knows this because we've been talking to each other about it for 15 years. The fact is that the, the vast majority of Americans don't know that there are energy fixes right. like what you're talking about. And it, it's my belief that if we got the word out, there would be a sufficient public interest uh, to drive congressional funding of this type of problem. We need 218 votes in the House and 51 percent. Easy to get if you get the people <laughs> conscious of these options. They are not conscious of them. Uh, my question was, did you consider telepresent operations on the moon instead of yes, the Most of the people working on this activity would, uh, would mm -hmm. go to work on the moon in the morning in their, in their, uh, at their workstation here on Earth. So we went to work on a deal with Delay time where equipment operators, for example, by and large, will be people will be here. Okay. And you still need 20 You still need to have about 56 people per mine. If you're going to operate it seven days a week around the clock and have people in there to load automated equipment to do such things as refurbish worn out parts on the mine. That's a preliminary estimate. Any number can play, so I'd be happy to see an analysis if I could lower it.
think we better cut it off there if we're going to get out of here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.